Here we go. Nita. Oh my gosh. When was the last time we saw each other? I feel Too like the long. last time I remember seeing you was at Rumble in Texas. I feel like I remember seeing you like as I was going out to call a match and you were there. I've been, that was a long time ago. It was two years ago. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Probably something like that. Maybe in Phoenix. Uh, Maybe, one of those. Oh, it was Phoenix, not in Texas. It yeah. was Phoenix. Yes. God, that's, that's even longer that's ago. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> I hate that so much. I know. It's crazy. Um, how have you been? How's tour? Where are you right now? Things are really good. Um, we are in beautiful Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Ooh, um, yay. Yeah. Um, at a surprisingly lovely hotel. Not that you'd be surprised if you have a nice hotel anywhere, but like, you know, you hear Sioux Falls, and you're like, cool, where are we going to be? And we're <laughs> at this like kind of like, I've got my matching plant to your background plant. Here we are. <laughs> it, it's, like, it's like yeah. a, it's a Zoom dream meeting set up. Totally. So I was like, oh my God, I have this little corner. I have this nice, like beautiful chair. We have the same in. setup. Like, We're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, tours what, are going great. Uh, what point great in the career the or, or what point in the tour are you at right now? So I have actually not really been home except for the holidays since last August, believe it or Whoa. not. Um, because I have been doing Alice Cooper touring and bouncing between this and my solo touring as well. So I'm from Alice's band to my solo band, back to Alice, back to my band. Uh, I went home for uh, a week, a week and a half or so around the holidays. Uh, and then besides that, I've just been on the road nonstop. So we're at about, I think, the midway point for me. Um, I will go finish out this tour um, at the end of the month. And then my solo band goes out opening for Zach Wilde and Black Label Society. And then I will go back to Europe with Alice. And then I will come back here for festival season with my band. And then I think I'll have a short break before uh, fall touring starts up. Holy shit. That's <laughs> it's crazy. wild. Do you How, miss it? <laughs> you know what? I actually, okay. So yes and no. There's yeah. times that like, it's funny because you saying that to me, I'm like, holy shit, like what a burnout. But at the same yeah. time, I know that when you're in it, you're just in it and it doesn't affect you as much as me hearing that sounds like it would wear you down little of both you know you definitely are just in it and you're just kind of like you just kind of put your head down and go uh it only really gets overwhelming when you think about it you yes. know when you're like oh my god I'm not gonna I'm gonna sleep one night in my bed from now <laughs> until the end of July like and it's what is it March or oh. April <laughs> you know like um so that's like sort of putting it in perspective like that it gets overwhelming but once you're in it and you're just sort of like enjoying it kind of remembering that attitude of gratitude, you know, we don't have to do this, we get to do it. And, totally. Um, and it, it makes it a lot easier, honestly. The, the worst part is packing. How the hell do you pack to be gone that long of like, I need this many outfits, I need this for different weather changes, like, that's the hard part. Oh, totally. That is the worst part. And the funny thing was, um, I went home for two days between my last tour and this Alice tour. And I thought, whew, winter's over, it's spring, like it's gonna be so nice. And then at Bye. the last second, <laughs> I looked at my, I looked at the dates and I was like, Canada, <laughs> Canada Sorry. in April is not warm yet. Nope. You, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was actually and just, uh, I was just up in Toronto like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And I've not been home in two, three years. It was something, something way too yeah. long. But yeah. I got home and I was like, oh, it is much colder in Toronto because we just moved to Cincinnati. And I was like, oh, the weather must be pretty similar. No, it's still much colder in Toronto. And it kicked my ass. I was not ready. Oh, yeah. We were just in Cincy, too. And it was cold there. <laughs> no. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And then we it's were just rough. in Toronto last week and it was snowing there. And now we're going back up to like Calgary, Edmonton next week. And it's going to be cold there. Where did you and guys play got, in Toronto? Do you remember? Um, it was uh, Meridian Hall, I think. No, oh, I don't even Is know. That the See, name? I don't know anything. Of I don't go I, anywhere. I could be anymore. wrong. <laughs> that could be it. it. You could be yeah. right. I don't know. I've, I've, I've not gone to a show in Toronto in years, but... They do have some of those like really cool, you know, 
historical buildings that, that they have yes. shows and stuff in. So I don't know if it's going to be one of those or not. Yeah, I, I think that's what it was. It was like, it's sort of like a, a lot of the, we're doing sort of like large theaters, small arenas on this tour. So yeah. it's like, um, and it's, it's always fun because we always do a lot of the same circuit as like the Raw and Smackdowns. Yeah. So it's always really fun going backstage and see posters like, oh yeah. my God, I remember seeing this and you know, <laughs> um, but this one was, I think sort of like a ballet type of orchestra type okay. of theater, you know, a little smaller than, uh, WWE was actually there while we were there. They were at the arena, like next door to where we were playing. Oh my gosh. Did you get to go over and check it out? I didn't. Both of our that. COVID restrictions are so oh. strict. Like we've yeah. actually been in the same city a few times since touring has started back up. But, you know, like I will text, you know, Becky or somebody that I know. I'm like, hey, I'm right around the corner. And they're like, hey, wow, we can't really have anybody <laughs> backstage. I'm like, neither can I, but <laughs> hi. Hi. Just like wave through the hotel windows. Exactly. What is what is the mental switch for you? Switching from playing with Alice Cooper to then going and doing your solo stuff. How do you kind of juggle the two? Because they're pretty different roles, right? Yeah, uh, I would say that it's a whole different level of sort of heavy responsibility, if that makes sense. You know, so to play in a, a with a classic rock artist like Alice Cooper, you have to really deliver the songs the way that the fans want to hear them. You know, they're not really there to hear Nita's version of I'm 18 or School's Out or Billion Dollar Babies. You know, people want to come to the show like, yes, to see us and yes, to hear us perform. But like, I don't want an Alice Cooper fan to ever leave a show and go like, man, I feel like I didn't get the Alice Cooper experience. I just got the Nita show. Like, that's not yeah. what I'm here for. That's what I'm, yeah. my shows are for. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> yes. come to my shows, you get the full on Nita show. It's soloing and shredding the whole time. And like, that's sort of my responsibility to show people like what I can do when I'm out on my own, give people that big rock experience on a club tour. You know, we bring a big light package. We make a very cool visual fun, high energy show for people that might not be expecting that from an instrumental guitar players show. What a gig you have. Like totally. you, not, I mean, yes, of course, playing with Alice Cooper is like, holy shit, you play with Alice Cooper, but just like the career you've had, the trailblazing that you have done for female guitar players, like, do you feel... I don't know if it's like the, the pressures of that, but like, what is it like being in your shoes, doing the things that you have done? Do you ever just get like reflective about it? You know, Josh and I talk about this pretty often. You know, my, you know, my boyfriend, Josh yeah. has been like sort of the, the backbone of all of this stuff happening because he has always had this, this big vision for me and bigger than anybody, any other guitar player in the world world you know who can say like they've played for an NFL team they've played at WrestleMania they've played at you know arena football and you know a band like Alice Cooper and this solo music and now with a single with you know one of the biggest singers in the world David Draymond and uh I think if I had had anyone else managing me none of this would have happened and sort of had this bigger vision you know to go hey no NFL team has a guitar player let's be the first one, you know, so no cool. one has ever played in the ring at a WWE event. Let's have you be the first one, you know, like all this kind of stuff. Um, and it takes somebody with a big vision like that. And, you know, all I can do is really just try to execute as best I can. And as long as I can keep executing his crazy ideas, we make a great team. <laughs> so nice though. It is nice when other people have those big visions for you and you can just focus on staying like dialed in to the thing that you do and let them do the business and let them have those kind of projections and different ideas for you. Cause it's hard sometimes to try to juggle like doing your own thing, but then also like, Hey, now what's next? What's my next big plan? You really need to have those people around you to help support those ideas and like get brainstormy with. No, totally. It really is, you know, having a good partner, whether it's a business partner or a romantic partner whatever it is, somebody, you know, or those of us are lucky enough to have somebody that fills both roles, yeah. as complicated as that can be sometimes. <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, no one is ever going to have your best interest at heart more than your partner, yeah. you know, so if you're able to work with your partner, it's just, it's a, a really, it's a really, really cool dynamic. What have the pros and cons been for you guys working together like that? I mean, I can relate to a degree in the sense that John and I both have worked in the the wrestling business and whatnot, but also we've had very different jobs and we don't 
John and I actually don't really overlap very often. So what is that like for you guys? It's definitely really interesting trying to put on our relationship hats versus putting on the sort of managerial Uh, I don't even want to say client. That's a weird word, you know, but like, (laughs) you know, he, let's call it his manager hat and his boyfriend hat, you know, like, cause I really only have one hat. Like I am just the same all the time. And a lot of the time he says, you can't, you can't think of me as talking to you like your boyfriend right now. You have to think of me as talking to you like your manager right now. Like, yeah, (laughs) you think, (laughs) But like, you know, like he's he basically, you know, there are times when we have to separate our emotions from the conversation and just talk business, you know, and uh, that can be really complicated. That can be really hard. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, we've been together a long time. We have been in business together a long time. We have a lot of full respect and love for one another. And I know that deep down, uh, his ideas as crazy and far-fetched as they may seem are always coming from the right place. So, uh, it's, it's really, really good. It's challenging, but it's good. What was your plan? No, I mean, obviously not necessarily the first time you picked up a guitar, but when your love was continuing to grow for being a guitar player to like being like, Oh shit, I'm actually pretty good at this. (laughs) Like figuring out like what, how to spin that into a career and what those lofty goals kind of looked like at the beginning versus the things you've been able to achieve and what's on your bucket list still. So I was really lucky to grow up in a musical family. My dad is a touring musician or, or was for many, many years before I was born. Uh, and my mom was a dancer and model that married a touring musician. So they both understand so the that's lifestyle. that's how we get Anita. We get this like <laughs> beautiful model dancer, touring musician, and bam, there my- she is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it. I got so lucky because I started touring really young. I did my first big tour when I was 15. And um, I think if I hadn't had parents that were sort of in the business for as long as they were, they wouldn't have understood that drive and that go out and, you know, take my summer break from high school and go out on tour for two months in a van, you know, with three other people. And uh, having that support and having that, you know, sort of blessing to like, hey, you want to go do this, go do it. Um, It went so far for me, really, to just being able to pursue it without fear of, of judgment, without fear of, you know, not without fear of rejection, because we all get rejected billions of times in this sure. industry um but love just a good say, door yeah, slamming go in my face i love it bring uh, it you know what yeah bring it bring all the doors on because you know what if that door slams the move to the next door move to the next door i'll kick, find a i'll find a window that same door yeah exactly sneak on in through <laughs> that window find your way in and you say like i'm here see me yes. hear me yeah um, and uh throughout the last, you know, I'm 35 now, so it's 20 years. So I've been touring, you know, longer than a lot of people's careers in any field, which is weird, Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> weird thing to say out loud. Um, but uh, throughout that time, I have always wanted to inspire the next generation, uh, especially of young girls to do what I do. Yeah. And it's so it's so cool to see the parallels between music and wrestling because when I was growing up as a young guitar player, there were not a lot of female guitar players to look up to. There were a few, um, but there were not a lot of like really technical, really incredible, like musicianship wise. You know, Mm -hmm. there were trailblazers, there were amazing songwriters, but there wasn't really anybody that I was like, this is technically inspiring for me. You know, like I looked up to the technicians, you know, the, the technique guys. Um, and now in the world of music, there's this incredible surge of amazing female guitar players. Uh, and just as this is happening in music, this is also happening in wrestling with this yeah. incredible wave of female wrestlers, you know, and nobody's having like a pudding match. Nobody's having like a tampon on a stick match. You know, <laughs> thank God for that. <laughs> And, uh, you know, nobody, nobody is telling me or Orianti or any of these, you know, female guitar players coming up that we need to show more skin or that we need to pose in Playboy or that we need Mm -hmm. to like sort of sexualize ourselves to be a woman in this industry. And it's just, it's amazing to see it happening across so many different worlds. And it's just, it's exciting to be a part of it. 
it's really cool. Yeah. To like, to see it all unfolding before our eyes, because, you know, we're like the same age and seeing that time, you know, when we're growing up and we have these ideas of who we want to be and the things that we want to do, that kind of was what we had to look at of like, okay, women are beautiful and they're these specimens and blah, blah, blah. But now to see the way that the shift has gone between just adding that like other talent element and bringing that other bit of like grit to whatever it is that you're doing. And it's not just this one dimensional thing. It's really crazy to see that unfold before your eyes. And I mean, yeah, even in my time with WWE, it's like you see the women that have blazed one trail and now there's this new trail that's being blazed. And it's, yeah. it's so cool to, in, uh, to imagine, yeah, with that next generation that's coming up, the, the things that are going to be busted wide open for them now that these other opportunities are out there. It's so cool. It's so amazing. You know, I was watching, you know, we're, we are filming this on WrestleMania Sunday and I was watching the <laughs> pre-show yesterday for set on Saturday. And I'm sure you saw it too. There's a little girl dressed up as Rhea Ripley. Yes. And she said, she inspires me to be myself. Mm -hmm. And, and I was watching that and I was like, man, you know, like if I was, you know, 10 years old, like, you know, when I was 10 years old, if I could have looked at like a strong badass role model like Rhea or mm -hmm. like so many of the girls you know that are part of the women's evolution in wrestling now like it would have been so inspiring for me you know like I remember that moment for me was when I saw Jennifer Batten playing with Michael Jackson at the Super Bowl mm -hmm. and when I saw her you know we talk a lot about representation now in this day and age and having a hero that you can look up to that looks like you or feels like you whether that means somebody gay somebody trans somebody black or white or you know however it is you need somebody a lot of people not everybody but a lot of people need somebody to look up to that looks like them that feels yeah. like them that they can relate to and for me that was my first moment of that seeing jennifer on the biggest stage in the world you know playing at the super bowl with the biggest pop star in the world just like shredding her face off <laughs> technique and chops and attitude and blonde hair and like mm -hmm. that was like I can do that I want to do yeah. that because now she showed me that I can do that and now Rhea and Becky and Bianca you know like all of these incredible women are showing the next generation of of wrestling fans that they can do it too Becky came out with a mullet and everyone was like hell yes <laughs> I was yes! so into that whole sort of David <laughs> Bowie vibe that she had going oh on oh my last god night. chef's kiss it was Forever. exceptional Mwah. so cool so i so love cool. it and, and how unfair that bianca just chopped her hair in the ring with a pair of shears and she came out with like i mean obviously it got doctored up after that but even in the you know as she was in disbelief in the ring i was like how is her hair still look so good <laughs> like, you know like i did so you becky I know she's just owning it. It's so cool. Yeah. But yeah, it, it is really awesome to see all these different flavors of people and seeing them succeed. And it just gives so many other people different ideas or it sparks a different thing to like make somebody's brain light up and be like, Hey, that's something that I can do. And it is, it's just, it's really cool time. And it's a cool time to be a part of it and to witness all of that. When Absolutely. do we get to see you and Rhea Ripley together? Because you've got to play Shinsuke Nakamura to the ring. And that was what a moment that was because not only does Shinsuke have like the best music and like the best, best entrance but when you came out to play for him at Wrestlemania what was that like uh three four years ago yeah 35 so yeah 35. I guess it would have been yeah wild Gosh. or was it 34 it was I, 34 yeah we're 34 New, was Orleans. New Orleans yes yeah okay New okay Orleans. 34 yeah. then um, because you and Rhea obviously would be a hell of a tandem. When do we get to see oh, that? I would love that. Get me and Ash Costello out. Ash uh, yes. on New Year's Day, who actually yep. sang her theme song. Mm -hmm. I would love that. Nothing would make me happier oh, um, except maybe giving Becky a new shreddy Celtic invasion. I uh, would very much enjoy that too. God, all of these moments. What was that like for you getting to play for uh, Shinsuke at WrestleMania? What was that day like for you? You know, it was so surreal. Um, it was really, because uh, this is another Joshism. You know, this is something that um, Josh really like willed into existence because we had no connections. We didn't know anybody at WWE higher up. You know, we had absolutely, you know, there was no like, hey, let me call up my friend and tell him this idea. Josh just sort of like got it in his head. He had this vision. He's like, you are going to play this song at WrestleMania in New Orleans. 
And I was like, okay, (laughs) you know, how are we? And like, and you talked about the doors being kicked down the door slamming in your face. I mean, like door after door after door, you know, we went through anybody that, you know, he could think of that he knew that had a connection in the wrestling industry. Um, And then he was so Who was your in? Who who was your in to kind of get in there? um, We wound up getting to Neil Lowey, who is WWE. You know, you obviously know he's in charge of all the music at WWE. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was literally to the point where we were like a week out from WrestleMania. And he was like, we need to book flights and a hotel. Like, and I was like, they didn't even text us back. Like, this is not happening. Like, oh can God. you just, can you just stop? He's like, no, something is going to happen. Like, and we need to already, we need to be there. And so when Neil finally called, he was like, Hey, so uh, are you available at this time? And you know, we don't have a, we don't have a lot of a budget. And I was like, I'm already going to be there. You don't need to give me a flight. You don't need to give me anything, maybe a hotel for the night of somewhere nearby. And he's like, done, done deal. Like, you know, oh my and God. if, you know, if we hadn't already had that flight, if we hadn't already been there, who knows? Maybe they would have been like, you know what? This is too last minute. We don't have a budget for flight. Like, you know, we'll, I did, we'll get I you on the next no one. I had no idea yeah. that that's how that came together. You guys like yes. manifested that. You didn't even manifest that shit. You just like made it happen. Josh so no willed it. Josh willed it into existence. And he had this vision. And then when Neil called me on the phone, he described this vision of Josh's like, exactly to a T like he was like I have this idea like of you being in the middle and like him coming down and like it was just it was a it was a surreal out of body experience of a moment of like this is so meant to be this is exactly how it was supposed to happen and if that's not proof then I don't know what is shit that's crazy it was wild I love that it's fun I mean it's one of those things where you see somebody, I'm like, oh, it's Nita. I mean, she's such a badass. You think that you would just be able to be like, I'm going to play this person's entrance is what I'm doing. But to like, know that you are still there grinding and making the things happen that, that you want to happen and that Josh thinks should be happening. And just like showing up, getting the flights, being in the, like you are setting yourself up for the success of like being in the right place at the right time, but like making damn sure that you're in that place when that yeah. comes through. Yeah, you know, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. It's one of my yep. favorite quotes. And if that opportunity had not had come and we weren't prepared, who knows what would have happened, you know, to like on it was definitely less than a week away, you know, as like a, it was as a non guitar player, it seems complicated to play his entrance. How was like you were just learning this on your own, being like, Hey, I'm I'm gonna know his song obviously in time to go in to play it. But like, what was learning his song like? You know, the song is so catchy and uh, it's not, it's it's not that I, I would say easy per se, but like, it's so catchy. There's not a lot of fast notes. Like it's a, it's a melody that obviously everybody can sing and hum Yeah. because everybody sings it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for me, the more difficult thing was sort of just adapting to a completely different vibe of performing you know Mm -hmm. to stand out there on the ramp you know with seventy thousand people and millions and millions watching at home (laughs) you know like uh and have it be just me and this huge circle of camera people which you're obviously very familiar with like it's uh it's intimidating yeah they're like right up in there and it's it's a very intimidating uh position to be in you know especially for the first time um and I remember standing there on the ramp and it was pitch black and, you know, they were doing a video package. So, you know, I had my in-ears in and the only, like, they just said, I was waiting for the lead camera to, I got to go like this and point Still. to me to start. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and, um, and then I, I don't really ever get nervous to play guitar. I get nervous for like regular life stuff, but I don't ever really get nervous to play guitar because that's what I do. I love, yeah. what I love doing. But then I started getting really nervous because I was staying there for like a long time. <laughs> like it was like a, you know, two, three minutes. Those packages just like... are long. Yeah. Sometimes yes. they're like five minutes long. You're like, here, we, where, let's go. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, I've just been standing here. Like I've been in position. I've been ready. I'm like staring at Stu and Stu is staring at me. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> oh my God, I don't want to miss the finger. <laughs> you know, like... <laughs> and then Renee, out of the pitch blackness, and like and I had not been announced nobody knows who the fuck I am in there like 
you know? And I was like, are they even gonna care? How's it gonna be? Da, 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 da. And then out of the pitch black, I hear someone go, let's go, Nita. And I was I like- I got goosebumps, oh my God. I was like, ah! And then like, just like that one sort of act of like familiarity of like, okay, there's one, <laughs> one person here is excited to see me. <laughs> like, um, I don't I have no idea who that person was, but if they are listening to the show right now, just know that you totally made my day and you oh. were probably the reason that that performance was as good as it was because it just sort of allowed me to settle back into my role and go like, oh yeah, this is what I do. Like That's this is am. normal. This is normal thing. I am going to go out there and kick ass because this is what we do. And this is like, this is what we always do. We're going to do the same way that we always do. And it just like, it just sort of allowed me to get back into that mindset of like, I was so caught up in the unfamiliarity and so caught up in like, you know, we had done rehearsal and Vince had given me a bunch of notes. I wanted to make oh, sure I hit shit. them properly. What kind and, of like... notes did he give you? <laughs> now, Vince notes can be so specific. It, they were very specific, but very hard to understand. Mm. <laughs> Um, trust me like, I know how that goes I'm like wait what was that can I hear that one yeah. again so um his main note that he had given me was uh he said you know I love what you're doing we we ran it once and he said I love what you're doing um you know yes yes so much charisma you know, like, <laughs> and he said um he said but when the camera pans over your head I want you to jump and I was like that sounds great absolutely when does that happen because I have no idea what's being seen on the monitor. It's like, I don't know when the camera, like the above camera is doing that. He's like, when the camera goes over you. And I was like, yeah, okay, I got it. But when does that happen in the song? And he's like, when the camera goes over you. <laughs> uh, and I was like, I was like, okay. <laughs> like, oh my God. I can like so picture I'm not going to ask him a fourth time, you know? Like, <laughs> Um, and then I asked Sue, I was like, when is he, when is he, what is he talking about? He's like, I'll cue you. <laughs> like, Thank God. Thank God yes. for Stu. And like, for Stu. Stu has saved my ass so many times to it. I'm like, what are we doing? And I, I like get the cue from Stu. I'm like, Thank God. Thank you so much. <laughs> so then, so then we rehearsed it again. And then I'm like, kind of like trying to look at the guitar and look at him. Like, what is the, what are we doing? And then when we did it, and if you guys watch it back, you'll see it's right when the song kicks in. Um, and he's like, I want you to jump. And then I was like, well, how do I jump like on a like an incline? <laughs> like, Imagine like, you bit it and you like fall down the whole ramp, which is like a mile long. Bro, I fall down on stage all the time. Like this oh, is sort of my God. gimmick. Like this is my, everybody knows I trip and fall all the time. You know, like I don't even drink. I don't even wear high heels. And I I eat shit all the time. So like, I was like, okay, the only, and like, I'm not a particularly high jumper compared to the wrestlers that you see who can like, <laughs> you know, fly through the air, like a yeah. freaking cats production, you know? So I was like, the only thing I could think of was to jump and then like land in this sort of like Spider-Man crouch thing. Oh, I, I can I was see like, it. I just pictured it. Yep. <laughs> so if you watch back, you will see the jump happens, the Spider-Man crouch lands, the camera flies overhead. And it was like, when I watched it back, I was like, it's so interesting to see the mind of Vince McMahon at work yep. because yes. it was just, it was so much cooler than just a steady shot of me right there playing guitar. It was this really dramatic moment that he absolutely orchestrated from the absolute get-go. And it was just, it was really, really cool to be, oh to sort of gosh. be a part of that happening. What a moment. I just like, that was so fun for me to just relive that with you. Cause I'm for, I'm just like a huge Shinsuke Nakamura fan to begin with. Me but too. I remember being like, I want to get out there. I was dying to see you play his entrance. And I knew that you were going to be there. And that was, I don't get out there like in the crowd that often during a mania, but I was like, I have to see that. And like, uh, what a goosebumps awesome moment so Thank cool you. wrestlemania is just the best I wrestlemania is is like it's unlike anything i've ever experienced you know and i've i've played to bigger crowds than that i've played to double the size of crowd of that in fact yep. like many times um but there is something really incredible about so many people from all over the world you know all ages all races all sexes 
coming together to experience something that everybody's so passionate about, you know, like if I come, if I play, you know, I played at Rock in Rio, let's say with Alice in Brazil, and you have 150,000 crazy Brazilian fans that love Alice Cooper and they're singing every word and like, that's amazing. We love it. But people aren't coming from Japan, Europe, Canada, America, like, you know, everybody, mm -hmm. every single state, every single country sort of converges into WrestleMania for this experience. And it's just this like beautiful melting pot that can never be duplicated, I think, by yeah. any other industry. Agreed. Agreed. It really is. I, I love just like that phrase of like, everything is wrestling. Everything comes back to wrestling. Everybody yeah. has some kind of a connection to it one way or another. And yeah, when that moment really happens and everyone is on the same page, it's, it's so cool. It can't be topped. Um, okay. Yeah. Let's take things back to you here because you talked about being 15 years old and going on your first tour. Have you always just been, are you like a workaholic to start at like 15? Yeah. Super workaholic. Um, it comes, I think, from growing up in sports. You know, I grew up doing gymnastics and um, I remember my first gymnastics competition. I did rhythmic gymnastics and um, I what trained sport. for a few what years. What a sport that is. Totally. It's bizarre. You look back at it now, it's either the ribbon and the hoop and the ball and like juggling it's clubs nuts. and like all kinds of crazy it's, shit. I was watching it during <laughs> the Olympics and I was like, are these girls for f real right now like dude it's wild holy shit. <laughs> so i did that from uh basically the time that i could walk until i started playing guitar at 13. um and my first competition i was eight or nine and i had trained my ass off for years and i went in like in the kids division and i swept the whole thing gold medals across the board Hell and yeah. the overall i was like yeah, like, you know, my mom with her dance background was so proud and my coaches were proud and everybody was crying and it was like such an amazing feeling. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, f yeah, like, you know, and then uh, I had another competition a few months later. <clears throat> and at that one, I went in and I did not medal at all, like not even a single thing, like not even a Shit. fourth place participation trophy mm -hmm. you know maybe i can't maybe a participant maybe everybody got a little something to take home when your kids you know yeah and i went i went crying back to my coach and i was like you know what happened she's like you didn't work as hard you know i had russian coaches so they were uh. mean and she said yeah you didn't work as hard you know you got comfortable and you didn't work as hard and that's why you didn't win if you want to win you have to work the way you did for the first one and i was eight or nine and i was like Oh, lesson learned the amount of work that you put in directly affects the result that you get in so mm -hmm. many words. Yeah. Um, so I think that that I really credit that with the attitude that I continued on with, you know, for the entire rest of my life, then getting into music, then practicing guitar and getting good at playing guitars. I don't like being bad at things. Yep. You know, like when it I sucks. started playing guitar, oh my God, it's it the suck. worst. <laughs> That's why I don't like playing video games. I'm terrible at video <laughs> games. I'll never play them with Josh because I suck and I don't like it. <laughs> um, and super competitive. So when I started playing guitar and I wasn't any good, I was like, well, this will never do. <laughs> like, it's not going to so, um no so uh so i became obsessed with the guitar and i would take my guitar with me to school you know you have a 10 minute break between classes you know i would run to my next class and i would take the guitar out and i would play for five minutes and then i go into oh class gosh. and then i would sit you know i was a, a weird kid i was a bit of a loner i had a hard time making friends you know so i had my one or two friends and i would just sit on the bleachers with them at lunch and i would sit and play guitar and uh I met the, you know, the members of my first band, we started doing little shows on weekends and stuff and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And we won uh, a couple of battle of the bands and then got to do uh, an opening slot on a very small stage on Vance Warped Tour, you know? Oh my and gosh, like, but like what a big, when you're a kid and Vance Warped Tour is coming through and you get to be on any one of those stages, holy shit. Totally, totally like life changing. It totally and, and it was just the most incredible feeling you know and the funny part about it was you know looking back at it now as somebody who is now a main stage player i remember playing on this small stage that folded out of the side of a semi you know Gosh. and the drums would go inside the semi truck and then the stage was the other side of the semi uh -huh. and um i would look across 
the you know the valley of the festival at the big stage and go like someday i'm gonna be up there someday i'm gonna be up there and now i have now i have gotten to and now funny enough how it all comes full circle i'm starting sort of starting over again as a solo artist and getting on these big festivals and now playing on the small stage again so sometimes funny. on the same day as alice so like i'll play at 2 p.m on the small stage in the tent and then I'll go change and then I'll come back at 10 p.m. and headline the big stage with Alice, you know? You get, so. Yeah, you get to taste like both ends of the spectrum of like doing a little bit of it all. That's exactly. Like, Keeps yeah, you humble. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's got like, how different do you feel after walking off the stage of doing your own solo act versus going on and uh, performing with Alice? You know, there's an emotional connection to your own songs. Always. Sure. Um, Which, by the way, you got me so good on April Fools, you little shit. <laughs> <laughs> I got everybody. <laughs> oh, it's such a good one. I you never said she was like Fools, doing the vocals so on like one of her albums. And I was like, oh my God, this is so great. And like, psych, April Fools, psych, losers. No, I still hate singing. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I felt very good about that April Fools joke. You know, people one. are still falling for it to this it is now April what for a third yeah. and people are still coming i had to go back and edit the post and say it was an <laughs> april fools because people were like do it i can't wait to hear your voice i'm like psych my voice is terrible oh um, <laughs> i feel like that can't be true though because even just talking to you you sound like you have like a beautiful tone to your voice thank you you know honestly like i joke a lot about being a terrible singer i'm not that bad honestly like you know like i if I put a lot of effort and work into it, I feel like I could. I just don't want to. I love Fair playing enough. guitar. I love playing guitar so much. If I have an extra hour a day to put into something, I want to play guitar. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I don't I don't feel pressured by all the people telling me they'd rather hear me sing. Like I want to play guitar. That's who I am as an artist. I have an opportunity to work with some of the best singers in the world, you know. Why would I be it's almost like egotistical feeling to be like no you know what i could work with david draymond of disturbed but instead i'm gonna sing like mm -hmm. you know why would i do that i have i have this okay if you were to be doing a song though if you were to take a second to like showcase nita playing guitar and singing what would that song be <laughs> what's in the wheelhouse oh my god I don't even I don't even know what my range is to be totally honest with you like you know I don't even sing enough you know like my my keyboard player cat and my solo band is my best friend in the whole world and like we'll go to you know back in the day when I used to drink we'd go to karaoke and like bang out some Bon Jovi oh, and stuff God, and I like... love <laughs> nothing more than that sounds great yeah yeah and it was so fun but then also she is like a phenomenal singer so like i always felt a little useless harmonizing with her because it's like <laughs> why do i even try because she's so incredible <laughs> like, i'll go grab another round i got i got listen nice round, you guys. stay up there yeah. <laughs> like, fiona apple and i will go get us some booze <laughs> and now that there is no booze involved i'm not doing it <laughs> oh to do karaoke sober hell no absolutely yeah. not no no welcome that's to my nightmare <laughs> <laughs> yeah no thanks couple cocktails no. <laughs> in i will take that mic and put on a show but otherwise no way exactly um, what was the what was the first album that you learned uh you know top to bottom you know i actually have never learned an album top to bottom believe it or not um wow i yeah never ever and uh it's interesting how different people's paths are with their instrument because uh, I know a lot of musicians who are like karaoke that can just play like, you know, get up for a jam night or something and play all these different songs. I have actually never learned a song that I didn't have to play on stage. <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> I've never like, I've never sat down and been like, you know what? I love Sweet Child of Mine. I'm going to learn Sweet Child of Mine from beginning to end. I'll be like, oh, I love this part of Sweet Child of Mine. So I'm going to learn that part. And then I'm going to integrate it into things that I do and put it in my solos and make it my own. Right. Um, but especially now at this phase of my career where I'm getting asked to do a lot of stuff like that. Hey, you know, play a name that riff or, you know, get you know go on the spot on these you know i do a lot of radio promo now you know now that i have a song on the radio and they're like hey you know we want to challenge you like do like a listener challenge where they challenge you with riffs and i'm like absolutely not <laughs> like, like, <laughs> because i just was never that guitar player like i just never really learned other people's stuff unless it was 
kind of like for work, you know, I rather I've always just written my own stuff and then done my gigs, which I love. So I've, this is kind of a random question, but having a song on the radio. So I'm currently reading Run Rose Run, which is written by James Patterson and Dolly Parton. Um, it's about a girl breaking into the music business and she is getting a song on the radio. What goes into getting a song on the radio? You know, this, uh, this last song, which is called Dead Inside, is my first real foray into the world of radio because up until this song, uh, my music was just instrumental guitar music. And that doesn't get radio play at mm -hmm. all ever. Like we were on um, liquid metal a few times. I think we may have gotten, you know, a quick shout out on Octane or volume through Eddie Trunk. Um, but really, you know, like you don't get terrestrial airplay. And um, going into the active rock world, going into, you know, not, you know, sort of like my home base, which has always felt like, you know, Sirius XM has always sort of felt like my home base. And, mm -hmm. you know, everybody there, you know, from Ali Hagendorf, who unfortunately is not the company anymore, but Ali and Jose and Kate and Shannon Guns, like everybody and, and Eddie Trunk has always like treated me so well on Sirius XM that stepping out of that and going to traditional radio, to ter terrestrial radio was like this huge, like, culture shock where all of a sudden it's it's politics and it's this and it's that and this you you have to make sure you give the right shout out from the stage in the right city and like sort of like these little things that um previously in my career i would have never even known existed so it mm -hmm. was it was a steep learning curve but it was such a cool one because the dj community you know in radio is just so supportive so ready to bring new music to their listeners and their audience that when once you strip away all the politics and all the sort of like silliness of of guest list or this or that you know you really get this incredible community of music fans first and foremost that are ready to bring new music to their audience which has been yeah. really really cool yeah it was, it's, it's just like interesting because you hear like I mean, I don't, I mean, I do know enough about the music industry. My dad works in the music industry. My brother does, but in terms of like that side of it, like just when I was like reading the, this book, I'm like, I wonder how much of that's real. I mean, I would imagine Dolly Parton puts a real authentic spin on how that actually goes. So it does sound like it's kind of like that, just like the politics weird yeah, shit it's, that has to happen. Yeah, totally. In, invite this person, but don't invite that person. If this, right. you know, this station comes, oh. then you can't shout out that, you know, or like whatever it is. Oh my like, God. And, and honestly, I think a lot of that doesn't even come from the programmers themselves. It doesn't even come from the people that are, you know, that are putting your song out, that are pushing your song, or maybe it does, yeah. you know, I, I don't know. Thankfully, my label, Sumerian Records, has a great radio team that deals with sort of that side of things and they will just send josh an email saying tell nita that this is this is the deal for today this is the deal for tomorrow this is the deal so like thankfully i'm not navigating it alone for the first time i've got really really good people sort of like josh and i are like just having our hands held <laughs> like okay help this me. way now help <laughs> me thank you Yes. <laughs> um, the fitness side of things for you. I know that that's a huge part of your life. I know that's something that you like really put out to your fans. Um, where did you, well, I mean, obviously your love of that came from playing sports, I would imagine, right? Did it come from the gymnastics background that you've just always loved being active? You know, um, when I started playing guitar, I really became fully single-minded in guitar um, and so my mom has this sort of like naturally lithe, tiny dancer body. I'm built like my dad, like my dad's side of the family is like tall and curvy and like, you know, uh, on the, on the less lithe side, let's say. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and, uh, so when I started playing guitar and I stopped exercising, um, I definitely started taking, you know, much less care of myself and I put on a lot of weight. And then I went through a lot of ups and downs in my own life. Uh, I went through a, a very serious period of, of addiction where I was living a really, really unhealthy lifestyle and I was very skinny then. Nope. Um, <laughs> but um, then uh, when I, I got off of drugs, I gained a lot of weight once again. And then when I got fully sober, I stopped drinking alcohol in 2015, I sort of made a promise to myself to, to say, if I'm gonna do this, if I'm gonna really take this really difficult step, 
um, I'm going to make it worth it. I'm going to get in the best shape of my life and I'm going to be comfortable in my skin again. I'm going to be happy with, you know, with how I feel and how I, you know, like how you feel about yourself is the most important thing. It has nothing to do with this critique, this constant judging and critiquing of, you know, the world outside of your own circle saying you're too fat, you're too skinny, you're too muscular, blah, 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 blah. Like mm -hmm. you just have to feel comfortable how you feel yourself. And that was my goal. Um, and so I started eating better. Uh, I started having my meals delivered on tour. Uh, oh, that's so I work smart. with the, yeah, I work with a company called Trifecta Nutrition, which is they will send out like a box of just like chicken and salmon and broccoli and asparagus and whatnot to my hotel once a week. And that is how I just maintain eating healthy. Um, I have great nutritionists that I work with, RP Strength, that sort of like help me stay on track and balanced. And then I work with a coach at Team Elite Physique and Tori from Team Elite and has really just sort of like whipped my actual fitness, like my gym routine into shape. Um, and that's been sort of my, my catalyst for it is just saying like, I don't know what to do now. Mm -hmm. You know, now I haven't done gymnastics since I was 12. I'm 35. <laughs> like I need to know what to do. Yeah. And COVID was hard too. You know, COVID was yeah. a, a tough, depressing time to be a musician. You know, you're off the road. Everything was shut down. We didn't know when we were going to go back to work. So like that was another big fluctuation for me to go, you know, on this roller coaster of of food and dieting and depression and anxiety and and all that mm -hmm. and uh so just recently i've i've gotten back on plan you know i started a new team elite physique plan a week ago like literally a week Hell today yeah. Yeah. i'm 2400 days sober today good for <laughs> like, you yay thank you so just um just really like taking care of yourself, having a selfish moment to say like, this is what I need, whether it's taking an hour to do some cardio and hit lift some weights, whether it's getting your food, your, your healthy, nutritious food, whatever it is, it's sort of like having that, that bit of a selfish moment for yourself to say, this is what I need in order to feel healthy and happy and safe and what, uh, it's serving well. What was, um, what was the moment for you? I mean, you talk about having addictions with, with drugs, alcohol. What was the moment for you that you were like, this has got to stop and I need to, I want to get my life cleared up. I don't want to be down this path anymore. Not, an you know, honestly, do. yeah. And, you know, honestly, the, the breaking point, um, again, was Josh. Um, we had been together for about a year at that point, a little less than a year and it was like sort of one of those tough love moments where you said if you're going to keep going down this path uh i may not be here with you at the end of it you know like he didn't say if you don't do this i'm leaving you but he said if you're going to continue to live your life this way and it, it honestly like i was a jerk i wasn't any fun to be around when i was drinking you know like mm -hmm. um i was i was really unhappy i was you know really insecure and it's funny because I was on one of the biggest tours of my life. You know, I was on, you know, out with Alice on the Motley Crue final tour. You know, we were playing arenas every single day, sold out shows all over the world, you know, America, Europe, United Kingdom, Australia, Asia, like, you know, and, uh, and I was just drinking myself to death in the middle of it. And it was stupid, you know, mm -hmm. like I wasn't even really enjoying it because I was hungover all the time and, yeah. you know, and I'm sure again, there's so many parallels between the music and wrestling world you don't realize how much you drink until you're on the outside of it looking in, you know? Totally. So like, yeah, it's, would, it's you know, crazy how it catches up like that, where it's like, you know, it's, it's easy to fall into that trap. I'll call it. It's like when you're on the road, it's like you totally. drink at the airport, you drink on the plane, you drink in the hotel lobby. You're like, you know, yep. after the show, you want to have a drink like in it catches exactly. up so fast of being this, social fun time that's what you do when you're on the road that's just how it goes to all of a sudden being like how do i pull myself out of this and can i still maintain what am i how can i still be social when i'm not doing these things yep. it's a really weird balance to to kind no, of no yeah you're exactly right and it's funny because you know exactly what you just described like oh i'm at the airport i'm just gonna have a bloody mary because it's you know that's what you do yeah. and then you're on the plane you're like oh, it's a long flight like i'm just gonna have a little airport class you know a little wine bottle you know whatever and then you get there and everybody's hanging out in the lobby you know waiting for the rooms to be ready or whatever you're just kill it, ch killing time at the at the 
lobby bar, whatever. Mm-hmm. Then you finish the show and then everybody's hanging out talking about the gig and you know, like you have a couple beers there. And then the next day you have a day off in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and you don't <laughs> know anybody and there's nothing to do. And there's, you know, so what do you do? You go find a bar and you hang out, and, you know, have a couple drinks on the day off, no big deal. And then it's not until way after all that is over and you look, you're like, oh my God, this is several drinks all day, every day. No, like I know who lives like that outside of touring people isn't it it's <laughs> you know, crazy like- it really it, it's crazy when you hang out with people that aren't from that world and they're like damn girl you can really throw them down because I, I mean yeah I, I I will have like the occasional drink now but obviously there's no drinking happening in our household these days and yeah. it really mm-hmm. is when you realize you're like holy shit man I could really throw them back I was oh, like, it was fun actually. Like I was very, I took a lot of pride in my drinking abilities same, back in the day. Same. Like, I'm like, I'll drink anybody under the table. Let's go. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I remember <laughs> Josh and I first started dating because he he drinks a lot and or not not anymore. Like he still drinks here and there, but like when we first started dating, we were both drinking a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh he would sort of like brag to his friends about me, like, oh no, she can hang. She's cool, you know, yep. you, you'll see. Like oh, and my uh God. Yep. And you know what, like, there's nothing wrong with going out, you know, like, obviously, I'm sure we both agree, like, there's nothing wrong with going out and having a having some drinks and of having course. a great time, you know, yeah. but yeah. if you're somebody like, you know, myself, that just really can't go out and have one and mm-hmm. can't, you know, go out and compose yourself. It's important to also realize when it's time to stop and when you're just when you're just kind of being a jerk. <laughs> it's better now. <laughs> oh, my God. I know when I think of like, just like argument, like drunk arguments Stupid or something. You're like, arguments. what the f- was that? It's, it's oh so my like God. time wasted and then like feeling bad the next day. But it's mm-hmm. funny once your body does adjust to being like, oh, I don't, I don't have to drink to be fun or to be yeah. social. It does take a little second to be like, what do I do with my hands all of a sudden? But oh, yeah, I, think, I think once you figure that out and you're like, oh, okay, this is nice. I, like, how nice is it waking up without a hangover? Oh, my God. A 2,400 days with no hangover. Yes. <laughs> like, I love that. So great. And, and it's also like I'm, I feel so present on stage now, too, mm-hmm. which is I feel, you know, like, yes, my relationship is better. My relationship with my parents is better. You know, my relationship, you know, like. I've lost a lot of people that I considered to be friends out of my circle of friends. And I realized they weren't really friends. They were drinking buddies, yeah. you know? And if you're not interested in being friends with me when we're not going out and getting shit faced, I guess we're not really friends. 100%. You know? And now, you know, I'm on stage and I can connect with so many people in the audience. Like I'm looking into someone's eyes and they're looking into my eyes and I'm like, I'm here and you're fucking here. And here, you know, like, we'll have this moment together and we will yeah. always like, you know, Triple H told me once something that has stayed with me forever. He said, you'll never remember, but they'll never forget. And yeah. I might not be able to remember every single person I make eye contact with during a show. But if I can give every single night, if I can give people that moment of like, I'm here with you, you're yeah. poison or like whatever yeah. it is, you know, and then yeah. and they can take that with them forever. That's not something I would do when I was hammered. Like I yeah. was just in my own little cloud of like, woohoo, I'm having fun, here like, we go, you know, like, and, uh, and I was not present at all for those shows, you know, how, how much has, I mean, I don't know if it has or not, but I think, you know, drawing the parallels between music and wrestling, has the music industry changed in terms of people being more aware of their health and not not drinking all night and staying up doing God knows what to yeah having that shift because I've noticed that in wrestling a ton where it's like those good old days of everybody hanging out the lobby and drinking and stuff like those (laughs) those really started to die down in the past couple years there's so many more people that just don't drink or just that they're just not about that life is it has that changed on the road as well it's exactly the same yeah exactly the same and it's it's kind of like a running joke between bands where like you know, you'll go hang out on the tour bus. And yes, there are some bands that have a good time after the show. You know, the, mm-hmm. the guys in the Alice band drink after the show. They'll have some wine or whatever. And um, and the guys in my solo band do as well. But um, it's not that like, oh my God, debauchery, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. breaking the tour bus windows and like bringing a bunch of girls around and like all this kind of stuff. Like it just doesn't really happen in the circles that I'm in. Other bands I hear about doing it, but 
uh, nine times out of 10, if I go and visit another band's dressing room or go on their tour bus or whatever, like we'll compare neutral bullet, we'll compare neutral bullet blenders <laughs> and like, oh, you do kale in yours, I do spinach in mine. And like, oh, look, this is this green drink, you know, like yeah. uh, I've been doing this green drink from a company called First Form every day. And I'm like, this is the drink, green drink I use. They're like, oh, I do this one. It has spirulina and that one has spirulina <laughs> and kale and da, 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 da. And like, this is the protein powder I use. And this one blends up really well. And yeah. pro tip about that. And, like, I love that. We were, when we were on the Motley Crue tour, um, we had this green drink that we were all drinking and uh, Nikki Six from Motley Crue got wind of it. And he would come and knock on our door every single day, every show day. And he'd pop his head around. He's like, hey, you guys got that shit? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's the green drink. <laughs> like, you know, like you would think that like, oh my God, you got that shit. It's like coming from Nikki Six, you know what he's talking about, yeah. right? It's the green drink. It's the spirulina. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. It's Yeah, it's so funny how like things like that change. And yeah, I, I love that. God, there was but something it's good. Else. No, it's great. Oh my you God. Know, like, no, it's, it's so, so much good. better. I actually saw a really funny uh, meme the other day that was like, what you think happens backstage. And it was like girls making out, like showing yeah. their boobs. <laughs> and then it showed what it's actually like. It was like a bunch of like middle-aged men just like hanging on. Everybody their, on their uh, phone. <laughs> everyone's on their phone. Everyone's just sitting on a road case. Like nothing that exciting yeah. is ever happening backstage. Uh, the days That's of totally the road. What it is. Um, totally. Okay. We, and- Oh, go ahead. Oh, I just let me, I want to add one more thing to that. It's funny because um, I posted something about this recently about my sobriety, and there was this big discussion that went on on my Instagram page about how music is not fun anymore for the listener, and and some people were making these really crazy comments about how music was better when all the artists were f-ed up out of their minds and dying early oh, and God. like all this stuff. And I thought it was so like kind of like kind of hurtful first of all like you yeah. want us to just die like you know, know right? but also like but also like how can you deny the artists or wrestlers that you care about their health and their happiness how can you yeah. be like well I don't you know like you know it's, even in your position like you're really gonna be like well what if he's not as crazy anymore you know what if he's this what if he's that it's like how dare you you know yeah. like how dare you say that this person can't be the best version of themselves and take the best care of themselves that they can. So I think that mentality of it's not cool unless people are getting messed up and having, you know, throwing up and destroying hotel rooms. Like, you know, I think that's the really silly way to look at it. Yeah. I mean, this shit, I mean, even, you know, just in the recent passing of Taylor Hawkins, like how exactly how fun is that? Yeah. Like not cool for anybody. Is it, that yeah, cool? So is that sad. great? <laughs> like, yeah, that's so rock and roll. Like that's not, yeah, not yeah, cool at all. Exactly. Um, okay, we've covered a ton of things here. Uh, the time is winding down, but I would be remiss to not talk to you about a little bit of Frasier. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so we are both Frasier enthusiasts. Um, who is your favorite character and what would you say is maybe your favorite episode? Oh my gosh. It's tough. I would literally watch Frasier every night going to bed. Every night. It's always queued up on Hulu. It's my feel good. Love it. I was horrified when they took it off Netflix. I'm so glad it's on the Hulu now. Like, um, did you have to get John into it or did he like it already? No, he liked it already too. We both liked it. It's funny. Unicorn. Yeah, (laughs) I know. (laughs) Did Josh like it or no? Absolutely not. He hated it. I had to like, I had to, I had to show him, like, I was trying to find the right first episode and I, I, I blew it a couple times. And then I finally showed him Wheels of Fortune, the Michael Keaton one. And that was the one that got him when he, when Michael Keaton plays, you know, this like, you know, I don't, I don't want to spoil it for anybody that's seen it, but it's, it's um, Wheels of Fortune so underrated. It's such an underrated show that like, because I, when it first came out, I it used to come on like late at night and maybe this is just, I've watched it going to bed for years and years and years, but it would always yeah. be on when I was like a kid. I'm like, I kind of like this show. And I would have never understood the jokes. They would have for sure been like way over my head. But I don't there's understand such a the jokes now. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I don't they're know not... what all the wines are and all the, you <laughs> know. know, there's like a, a lot of sherry. French words I don't know. And like, <laughs> um, but I think it transcends all of that. You know, like it's not about, you don't need to understand, you know, the jejum of the show yeah. <laughs> to like. To understand, to really... they're so ridiculous. 
they're so ridiculous and like it's just it's like a comfort show it's like a it's like a blanket you know and having something like that you know i don't mean to keep constantly going back to the road the road the road but like you know as you know and i know and everybody in both of our industries knows like you need something to ground you when you're mm -hmm. in a different place every single day you know you're in a different country you're in a different bed you're you know sleeping on a bus and you're sleeping in a hotel and then you're sleeping in a different hotel and then you're sleeping in an airplane seat or whatever and if you have a show like Brazier, you have sort of like a friend with you you like sort of yeah. like a security blanket of like okay well this is all different but that's normal yeah it's like a nice familiarity to have like there when, especially when hotels started having netflix in all the rooms i was like oh my god thank god i mean not that it's on netflix anymore but at the time yeah it was, i know i know because not often do they have hulu usually just like netflix yeah. and youtube or something but no it's true it, yeah. it's very true to be able to have that thing what is your other thing is there something when you're on the road that makes life on the road better for you that you have learned uh over the the many years that you've been touring you know i just started bringing my dogs oh. um, on my solo tours i can't bring them out with alice but um when it's my tour and i'm in charge uh, i just started bringing our dogs and that has just like lit up our lives you know mm -hmm. i have two little rescue dogs and a little rescue kitten who uh, unfortunately, our cat Pantera cannot come on the bus oh. because she is toilet trained. She uses an actual human toilet. Yes, I toilet trained her. And oh my God. as you may know, you cannot go number two on the toilet <laughs> on a tour bus. <laughs> so, Don't poop on the bus. You can't that poop is on a the bus. rule. Hard so, and fast rule. <laughs> exactly there can be no solids in the bus so pantera can't come in the bus because she uses the toilet and she can't poop in there <laughs> oh my god that's amazing i but love the that. dogs do the dogs come on on the bus and they are just like just our little rays of sunshine it makes everything because like you know i'm gonna be home a grand total of less than two weeks in a, in the calendar year from oh, last august crazy. to this august and you know like my dogs are both getting older you know bentley and my oldest my oldest one is going to be 13 this year like wow. you know and i was just all sad i'm like i'm missing them I'm like they're away what if something happens and da, 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 da. Wow. and um so we we brought them with us on the last tour and they're just perfect little travelers you know they're both about this big just like little balls of black fluff <laughs> they very happily go between all the bottom bunks you know yeah just... my dogs did that too we took a tour bus so when we moved from vegas to cincinnati i rented a tour okay. bus for that in blue our Fine. bulldog is like such a bougie little shit he comes like <laughs> marching on the bus like of course i've been here before i know what i'm doing he found his bunk he hung uh, out in his bunk. He shut it down. We've had Blue on a private plane before, and because he's done it more than once, he yep. knows his way to get on there. He sits in the captain chair. It is the funniest, most ridiculous thing I've ever. Like I know it's people are going to be like shut the fuck up, <laughs> but it's so funny. It, oh, it's like, great. Those pictures make me laugh so hard. Him just like thinking he deserves this treatment. Oh yes, I will send you pictures of my two dogs in the the driver's chair of the bus as well. Like, and they're just like, yeah, and <laughs> <laughs> where's my green juice? Let's go. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I love it. Well, Nita, it's been so fun getting to talk to you, have you on the show, and take a little trip down memory lane of of your WrestleMania moment and learning about life on the road for you. But you are such a badass, such a trailblazer. Um, you you mentor a lot of other young artists as well, right? That's something you spend a lot of time doing. Um, I, I do my best to, you know, just via my social media or via my Patreon page, you know, especially on Patreon, because it's a smaller group that mm -hmm. I can just sort of um, laser in on those type of, you know, those people, the smaller group of people, rather than, you know, the million or so on social media, I can mm -hmm. laser in on like these, you know, a few hundred in Patreon and, I'm always saying like, hey, give me, you know, post up your videos. Let me give you some tips. Let me give you some critique and, you know, advice about their bands and starting out and stuff like that. And That's so cool. I wish I had more time for it. Uh, hopefully after this year cools off a little bit, I'll be able to spend more time, you know, even going and speaking at schools and stuff yeah. like that. That's something I would love to do in the future. Hell yeah. Well, I can't wait to watch you continue to rise and continue to do so many amazing and badass things and to go from 
this is a side stage with your solo gig moving on to that main <laughs> stage it will happen and I, I can't wait to see what other kind of things you and josh drum up together thank you so much it is always such a pleasure chatting with you i feel like this is the longest conversation we've ever gotten to have I which know. is just a we're shame always just like we're always passing each other in a hallway like hey how's it going we never get like oh my God. this time it's funny i find that a lot of times when i hop on like even some people that like i spent years with on the road that i'm like man we just had like got to really talk there you just don't have yeah. time like this really ever during the day at a show or whatever to to shoot the shit like this so it's always really nice to like actually get to talk for a little bit totally yeah all right well enjoy the rest of your tour enjoy um south dakota i'm sure it's gonna be good to you <laughs> they, they <laughs> always are <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right i'll talk to you soon thank you so much bye, bye guys